why you came into the Institute? It's a mysterious question. <laughs> why, uh, why our lives end up the way they do. I think that um, I had decided, felt that I wanted to be a sister, and I talked to a priest that I knew, and he told me he knew a, a group of sisters who were dedicated to the Sacred Heart, and um, my family had always had a picture of the Sacred Heart in the house, you know, and Italian Catholics, and um, so. And he said also they have hospitals and I was already a nurse. And um, so he said they have hospitals, they have, you know, work that I think you would like to do, et cetera. Why don't you meet them? And so uh, I came down here to Columbus Hospital in Chicago, because at that time I was working in Chicago. And um, I came down here and I met Sister Regina Casey and I met Sister Irma Lungi, and I met Sister Therese Morandi. And uh, Sister Regina was very good. She gave me a book about Mother Cabrini, read the life of Mother Cabrini, she said. And um, so I did that, and it was stunning to me, the work she had done, interesting. Um, touched me very much. and her relationship of trust with God and the way she worked among the people. This is Mother Cabrini. And then um, Sister Therese was a young sister and very, um, very kind, very uh, interested. And Sister Irma Lungi was the head of the three hospitals in Chicago, Cabrini and Columbus and Cuneo. And she took an entire day off, which to me was amazing because I was working at the time and I was a supervisor in another hospital and I knew what it took to take a day off uh, when you're doing that kind of work. She took a day off and she brought me around to the hospitals and what really struck me <laughs> was that she knew everybody. She knew all the doctors and would ask about them and their families when we when we would pass by them. She knew the ladies who were working in the kitchen. She knew the people who were cleaning the floors. She knew everybody by name. She had an idea about their families. She would ask about them. And so besides taking so much time, I was really struck by uh, how relational and and I, I think that may be a central piece over the years that I've understood about the charism and the Sacred Heart spirituality is that um, the center of the heart of Jesus is relationship. It's relationship, relationship. There's nothing else. There's probably nothing else that, that matters much in life beyond relationship. And... Uh, with the heart of Jesus, it's a relationship of, uh, of love, of compassion, of forgiveness, of starting over again, but it's all built on relationship. And although now I can say it in that way, at that time I couldn't have said that, it was only that I was attracted to it. I was attracted to this central thing in the charism of of the missionaries of the Sacred Heart, which is relationship with God, relationship with yourself, and relationship with other people, particularly. Very nice. I, um, I want you to, to, to tell me, as you, as you did earlier, why is this place special for you? And if you could... uh, the, uh, the shrine here in Chicago um, is really special because um, I made my final vows here. Uh, this is where I uh, made my vows, and I just remember I love this over here um, of Mother Cabrini and the Sacred Heart because in it, they look like they're talking to each other. 
its relationship, you know? And I remember kneeling there before I before I made my vows, before my huge family came into the <laughs> came into the chapel here and uh, um, you know, asking mm, asking for that kind of relationship um, with with Jesus and with others. And so, yeah, th this place has a, a very special meaning for me. Thank you. And, and when, when you first entered the Institute, how, how did Mother Cabrini's legacy, the charism, impact your life when you first entered? I suppose when I first entered, I was just being led along, you know, and uh, and I suspect it was the um, the kindness of uh, of the sisters I met, I, like the sisters I met in Chicago uh, before I went off to Rome to study. Um, everyone that I would meet would say, "Oh, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you every day." But, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, it doesn't mean that there weren't some sisters who were a little bit difficult. There were, you know, because that's the reality of life. But the majority of the sisters would have been just very kind and very present. And I think that uh, that impacted me a lot. Uh, they were always interested and uh, more interested in you than they were in themselves. And I, I think I was very, uh, maybe I'm going to say it again. I had no idea that this was going to come out. But it, it's like they were very relational. <laughs> Thank you. And, and so now, as, as you live out your life today, how does Mother Cabrini's legacy uh, and, and the charism impact you? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm amazed at what Mother Cabrini and the sisters did, even more so as I know how difficult it is to get anything done. Do you know, when you're young, other people are doing it, and you're kind of joining in. And as you get older, you're the one trying to make it happen and recognizing how difficult it is to make something happen, and not only to make it happen, but to make it sustainable so that you can continue, or you don't have to continue, but other people can continue to do the work. So I, I, I'm always amazed at what, uh, at what she did. I'm also, in reading her letters and things like that, you know, she had a lot of young sisters. And being in Africa, that's what I have too, a lot of young sisters. And I saw how often, um, she was the, the one carrying a lot of the responsibility for things because uh, the sisters were scared. They didn't want to get things done. Um, they were just learning and so on. And uh, when I was working in the United States, I was always working with a whole group of sisters who had done many things already. And so you were working together. The working, the working together, um, and, and I think Mother Cabrini did that with a group of sisters, and that was part of her legacy, too, that she allowed people to go out and to do many things. But uh, I think the part of her legacy that I uh, think about now is uh, how much she had to do with only a couple people until everybody else learned what to do. And I, I try to really em, embrace that uh, because Mother Cabrini's life can look very romantic from the outside. Um, and I'm sure she had her romantic moments. Uh, but I think mostly it was hard work, willpower, and trusting that um, trusting that if she did the best she could, God would get the rest done. And I think that's the legacy that I feel the most. Thank you. Um, 
Well, what was it like to live in community for, the, for so many years? It, it has been good and bad, uh, mostly good. Uh, I have found among the missionaries of the Sacred Heart uh, people who are great partners and encouragers of, in my spiritual life, as well as just a human. And so I've found both human and spiritual um, support and interaction uh, in my years in community that have been very, very good. Uh, because there are times when humanly we go through really difficult times and and there's always somebody that I can talk with, really. And uh, there have been, and there are times when uh, it becomes hard to continue in your spiritual life. Things seem so empty and so like ashes, <laughs> like ashes. And uh, I have always found another sister who could really support me and pray and talk me through the hard times. So community life uh, has been, um, it's been a necessity. It's a necessity for me. Thank you. Um, and this, this is uh, a, a question that, that I think you, you, you can answer with some great difficulty. <laughs> What's the most profound, important, life-changing experience in your work as a sister? You know, there have been several profound and life-changing experiences um, as a sister. I, I think that my, the opportunity that was given to me to study was uh, really a, a profound and life-changing experience for me. Um, it allowed me to do work that I never would have guessed that I would be doing um, in formation over the years. And it was profound because it took me um, to Italy. It took me to living many years in Rome and getting to know um, a whole group of other sisters that were there, etc. cetera. Um, it was a life-changing experience for me to, when I became provincial of the Stellamaris province because it was so big and it encompassed the United States, the Philippines, Taiwan, Australia, and Swaziland. And they were all so, so different. And we carried many, many big institutions at that time. And uh, big institutions, many of which were in trouble because it was the years when hospitals and other places were, were really getting into trouble. Um, things had changed a lot and so on. And it was life-changing for me because I went to many places and just entered into cultures I never thought I would see in my life. And But the second life-changing thing about it was um, that I knew it was something that I was happy to do, but never wanted to do again. And when I finished my six years as uh, the um, uh, provincial superior of the Stella Maris province, uh, and I started really praying about it, what I said to God is, please, find me something that will save my soul and remind me why I came in to be a missionary sister because I didn't 
become a missionary sister to do multi-million dollar deals. <laughs> and, and plus, I'm not good at that stuff. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to be as concrete as I could be. Being a nurse is pretty concrete. And, and that's what I started out with, and, and that's who I am, I think, uh, very much. And so, uh, and I think God really listened to me. And he really did. And uh, when I went on a visit to Swaziland at one point toward the end of the time when I was provincial, and the people there were all dying of AIDS, and you know that it was the highest number. They lost 33% of their population to AIDS. Uh, and so, and it was not a men's disease, it was a woman's disease. It was quite different than in the United States. Um, and I was there and I was with the sisters that were there and so on. And okay, I, I was there just to support them. And uh, when I got on the airplane, the little airplane, there was a little propeller plane I, that used to go between Swaziland and Johannesburg. And when I, when I got on the airplane, I was, it was so dusty down there because it had been in drought since 1994. So it was really dusty and you always had dust everywhere. And I took off my sandals and I was in the plane pouring the sand on the floor <laughs> from my sandals. And this voice in, inside of me said, I even love the dust of this place. I, I was so stunned, you know? It, it was like, what? I even love the dust of this place. And I thought, oh, okay. I just let it go. But a year later, when it was time for, um, when it was, I was finishing my time as provincial, um, and I started praying about it. I thought, I think I should go back to Swaziland. And I thought, those are fantasies of old age. I was 61 years old at the time. I was 61, and I said, you're going to go to Africa when you're 61 years old, you know? So anyway, I, I thought about it. I prayed about it. I asked the new provincial what she thought, and she said, you know, she thought it was okay. I went to a marrying old program to prepare myself to do it. They said they thought it was okay, and, and so I went. I don't even remember the question. It was great. That was great. <laughs> okay. That was great. Oh, okay. That was great. Okay. That was great. So um, if you could, uh, I, I know you did it earlier, but um, could you describe your current ministry, uh, you know, sort of what, what, you, what you were charged with? Yeah, can, can I say something else about the other? Oh, sure. Do you know, yeah. when, what was really life-changing for me in Africa was having to dig into my will in a way I think I had never done before. You know, sometimes I felt like literally, like literally I had to go in with a shovel and pull my will up <laughs> out of myself because there was so much I didn't understand and there was so much difficulty. You know, there's the regular difficulties of no water, no electricity, no cell phones, people dying all around you, you know, those kinds of things. But they're uh, learning to, uh, I always had driven, but learning to drive a truck with a, you know, shift, <laughs> all these gears and stuff and no roads and um, really. I used to come home and I'd be in New York and see these big, high bottom SUVs, you know, on a regular paved road. And I'd think, oh, I need that so badly. What are you doing with it here? When I, I we, you know, we had no roads and we were in mud all the time and we had these terrible cars that didn't work anyway. But I think that when I would pray at night, because so many times in the first couple of years, I thought maybe I shouldn't be here. I don't know how I'm going to go on. And, uh, and that kind of thing. And when I would pray about it, um, a couple things would come up. One was always this thing that came from Isaiah, which was, 
I will lead the blind on a journey. By paths unknown, I will lead them. And I thought, okay, 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 I'm blind. So you just lead. I'm blind. I, I don't see exactly how we're going to go and how we're going to do this and what we're going to do. But, um, and, and in a sense, that was life changing for me because it just dipped me into something where everything was foreign and everything was difficult. We used to call it Swaziland, the land of inconvenience for, for everything. And also, um, it was life-changing to be able uh, to work with another sister, because there were only two of us there at the time, and um, to work with another sister where we could, we really had the capacity to sit down and talk and argue. We argued a lot. Um, because we saw things quite differently many times. I mean, we had the same goal, but we really saw things differently. And we, we argued a lot, but um, we really learned to love each other and, and to love the people and to just push outside of ourselves every day. But we also had the capacity to sit down and talk about things and to see how we could make things move forward and so on. And in that way, in the relationship with, with Jesus, in the relationship with God, and in the relationship um, with uh, Sister Barbara, who I was working with at that time, uh, those things were life-changing, not just externally, but deeply internally life-changing. You remembered the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so reflecting back on your life as an MSC and as a bearer of the love of Christ, what have you found most fulfilling in your work? In my work. Or in your life, if you like. The, the most fulfilling thing I think I found in my life is that um, is that we really can as human beings and that I can as Diane grow in a relationship with God and and that there's a real possibility to have a relationship with God and that it's a relationship that can grow and um, that's really quite amazing, I think. It's the most amazing thing ever, that one can really um, have this relationship with this hugely mysterious being. Um, and and uh, relationship with other people. To, yeah. I, I suppose that the question was the most fulfilling thing. Yeah, the, the most, most fulfilling, fulfilling thing. The most fulfilling thing is is um, having persevering in relationship. Persevering, it, whether it's with God or with myself or with other people, it's when things are good, when things are bad. Um, it doesn't matter when I feel bad, if I feel hurt, if I feel betrayed, if I feel whatever I feel, and sometimes even by God, you know, uh, it, it's sticking with the relationship and watching how it transforms in some sense. At the moment, it doesn't look like it's going to be anything or, except not good. And then gradually by persevering, it transforms, and the love that uh, that I have grows deeper. In in uh, by persevering through good times and bad times, and n not jumping around and changing and looking for uh, looking for something new to make me feel excited. To learn to live with depression and. Um, unhappiness and unfulfillment is ultimately fulfilling. 
That's that's good. That's yeah.